remember where you were when you heard about the event that was leading to your uh, eventual combat experiences? Like, um, like you could say, when they knew they were 9-11 or around you know, Pearl Harbor. Do you remember the moment where you realized that you were going to become involved in, in combat operations? Actually, no. I uh, enlisted in the Army in 1966. Uh, went to basic training in Fort Gordon, Georgia, and had advanced individual training in Fort Jackson, South Carolina in a personnel course. I was shipped out to, I thought, Fort Bliss, Texas and El Paso, and they said, well, you're not exactly here, you're not exactly in Texas, you're going to be in New Mexico. And found out I was 60 miles out in the desert at a little range camp where they were reactivating auto, old World War II automatic weapons, uh, primarily anti-aircraft type automatic weapons, uh, quad 50s, 450 caliber machine guns and dusters, two 40 millimeter automatic firing cannons mounted on a, on a track. But I went there as a battery clerk. Uh, and never never had any formal training on on the weapon systems can you explain um, to the viewers what what a why they call it a duster yeah it's a nickname it's a, it's a Bofors 40 millimeter automatic firing weapon uh, that was most people are familiar with as pom-pom guns on the old uh, naval movies from World War two uh, we mounted them on tracks, and when you fired them, especially during the dry season in Vietnam, they kicked up a lot of dust. And plus, they were they were a relatively mobile, fast track. So I remember I was at a place called Camp Eagle, which was outside of Way and Phu Bai in Vietnam, when the 101st Airborne came up north in Vietnam to I Corps. And their commanding general had an aversion to dust. And he put a five mile an hour speed limit throughout the camp. And duster can't idle at five miles an hour. So it, it was a, really a source of irritation to him. Why did you enter military service? I was a country farm boy from Pennsylvania. I had a burning desire to go to college. When I got out of high school, all my friends were going to college. And the money wasn't there. So there was no way I could go. Uh, it was inevitable. The draft was inevitable. And even though I was working at the time, I, I, I went down to the enlistment office one day and decided, well, get this over with. And then looked to college after I'm done with it. Three years. Mm -hmm. You were obviously involved in the uh, Vietnam War. W at what point did you um, did you know that you were going to go into Vietnam? And, and tell us how, how you got from the United States to Vietnam and, and to work with Vietnam. Almost uh, immediately when I got out to Oro Grande, the range camp in New Mexico, it was obvious that we were being prepared for Vietnam, it was obvious we were probably going as battalion strength. And after I was there for a couple of months, any question was removed. We were, they started prepping the guns and everything else for transportation. And we, we went over by ship. We went on the USNS Hugh J. Gaffney, which I think they sank off Hawaii for target practice just a few years ago. And that was, I guess, a taste of what the World War II vets saw as you went over on a troop ship and you found out what it was like to sleep five or six high in bunks with a sewer pipe running three inches above your nose. And even though I've spent a lot of time in the water, I, I know that for 16 days I didn't feel quite right. I never got deathly ill or seasick, but 
I don't think I ever ate breakfast either. I spent a lot of time on deck. Now where in Vietnam did you stay? We landed at Quinh Nhan and were moved inland to a little place called Phu Cat. And we were intended to go in to support the first air cav at An Ke and play coup, but somewhere in the middle of this, the Third Marines decided they could use uh, automatic weapon support, and somebody made the decision that we were going to go up north in Vietnam to the DMZ. So we were transported to Da Nang, and our guns were transported by sea to Da Nang, where we put everything together and then convoyed further on up north to uh, the 3rd Marine Division headquarters, which was located at Dong Ha. Uh, what, what year was this? Uh, this was all late in 1966. I think we landed in uh, Vietnam. Uh, we left the States in October and landed in early November. And it was probably the end of November, early December, when we actually convoyed from Da Nang to Dong Ha. And what unit were you assigned to at this time? First Battalion, 44th Artillery. And I was with the attached Quad 50 Battery, which was G Battery, 65th Artillery. And can you explain uh, to us how a unit like that is, is made up and, and as in the big picture, and then how you fit into that big picture and what your responsibilities are? There were three main automatic weapon battalions in Vietnam. The 5th of the 2nd was down south in the Delta area, the area around Saigon. The 4th to 60th was eventually ended up in the Central Highlands supporting the 1st Air Cav, and the 1st to 44th was attached to the 3rd Marine Division in I Corps, the northernmost province in Vietnam, right below the demilitarized zone. Each of our battalions was made up of four duster batteries a headquarters battery, an attached quad 50 battery, and I believe all had an attached searchlight battery since we were basically an air defense unit. I know that when we first arrived at Dong Ha, they actually placed the guns around the airfield. Some of them, speaking of the quad 50s, some of the quad 50s were still mounted on trucks, others were. Uh, slung under helicopters and placed on old French bunkers that existed around the airfield, but it rapidly became obvious that there was no air threat. And then we were relegated more to convoy duties. Every morning we would support the mine sweep operations because the roads weren't paved. And other units were put out to different fire bases. Now, now were you on a Quad 50 or? A I, was on a, I was with the Quad 50 unit. Quad 50 unit typically has a driver, a loader, a gunner, and a squad leader. And what was your role? All of the above. I started off, uh, as I said, I went over as a battery clerk. And I guess in a, after three or four months of that, I, I must have felt like I was missing something or else I just got bored playing pinochle with the battery commander and the XO and the first sergeant, but I volunteered for the guns. And uh, Lieutenant Burgett, who was our battery commander at that time, said, La Lava, if you want to go to the guns, you better find a replacement and train them. So it took a while, but I did that. And the first place they sent me was a hole called Contien. Contien was about a thousand meters below the southern edge of the demilitarized zone. Uh, when I went up there, I think it was probably May or June of 1967. And I remember they stuck me in a gun, and I fired off a couple of belts of ammunition. They said, you're trained as a gunner. And they decided to make me driver and until the first time I drove down the road, and they decided, no, gunner is you, the right job for you. And I became a gunner. And what rank were you when you um, arrived in Vietnam, and what rank were you um, after your return? I was probably a private E2 when I first went over. I was probably a uh, PFC when I went on the guns, made spec four shortly thereafter, and a couple of months after that was promoted to 
sergeant as a squad leader of a quad 50. Can you tell us about any of your experiences that stand out in your mind um, of significance or any combat experiences that you had um, during your career? I have said and I have written that I have learned three vital lessons in life. Number one, never trust anybody blow sunshine up your butt. Number two, never plan a two-week vacation. Something bad always happens. And that, the first time I ever planned a two-week vacation, my dad died the week before. And number three was a lesson I learned at Compiègne. This was, I believe, in September of 1967, well documented as the Siege of Compiègne, where we would catch anywhere from 400 to 1,200, 1,500 rounds a day. Now, Compiègne, which means Hill of Angels in Vietnamese, and it's certainly not, not a, we left a lot of angels there, but it was hell on earth. Very comparable probably to Kaysan, except the incoming fire was in a much more concentrated area. All of Compiègne involved a, a couple of acres. It was a small bump in a landscape surrounded by rice paddies, and it was within reach of North Vietnamese artillery. So we weren't getting hit by Viet Cong with little 62 millimeter mortar tubes out in the rice paddies. We were getting hit with uh, 122 millimeter artillery, 152 millimeter artillery. At times, every tube they had would be firing at us. And during the rainy season, you were living underground, you were in trenches, you never got out of the trenches. Uh, you collected rainwater because it was too dangerous to go over to the water resupply point because it was always targeted as soon as a helicopter had come in with a water buffalo, uh, which usually then had a survivability of about five minutes if you weren't right there. It, there wasn't any, it wasn't holding water anymore anyway. But one day, it got quiet after our usual seven o'clock wake up where they would always throw a few rounds at us saying, since you guys were on 50% or 100% alert last night, we're not gonna let you get any sleep today either. And it got quiet and I went outside and I remember I've never ever opened a, this can that comes out of a C ration carton. And I'm gonna try it. And I was sitting there with my little P38 opening this little can of dessert, my head exploded. It was like a white, white light just came in. And I remember I was knocked unconscious. I came to, and I was probably 20 feet from where I was sitting, opening this. And there was blood coming out of every orifice. And I thought I was dead. And I remember grabbing the back of my head, and all I could feel was mud just caked and plastered. My helmet had been blown off. And I later found out that a 152 round had come in right at the corner of the bunker, impacted and exploded. The guys inside obviously were concussed, couldn't hear, but they were only hurt by splinters of flying wood and stuff. I was concussed, couldn't hear a thing. But the lesson I guess I really took home from that is I'll never ever try date pudding again. And that was, it's terrible stuff anyway. <laughs> Can you tell us about tech? I, I extended in Vietnam and I went home on 30 days leave. When I came back from leave, they sent me down to the, into the Quezon Valley and by this time, we were running short of we, all that original group that had come over by ship had rotated back to the States. And we were short of senior NCOs, and I was an acting section chief. So I was a young, dumb Buck Sergeant E5 acting as an E6, and theoretically in charge of four quad 50s. And the Americal Division had taken over this area between Chulai and Da Nang from the 1st Marine Division who had moved on, on up north. 
and we had been attached to them. And we had two uh, quad 50 at a place called LZ Baldy, two quad 50s at LZ Ross, and a quad 50 further out the valley at a place called LZ Leslie. We were there for, from December into towards the end of January. And I remember that we were transferred up to, by helicopter, to Quang Tree. And then we were going to go on up to Dong Ha and get gun trucks assigned to us because our guns had been left back at the, at the fire bases below Da Nang. And on the 30th of January, we ran a convoy from the 29th of January. We ran a convoy from Dong Ha down to Camp Evans, where we stayed overnight. The next day, we went through Way on this convoy. And that was always a highlight for us. Way was a beautiful city. The University of Way was in Way. And there was a lot of young, very pretty Vietnamese girls who went to the University of Way. So we'd always take off our steel pots and probably slick our hair down a little bit and watch these girls and go on down to our base, which was at Fubai, a little bit south of Way. We didn't know it, but most of Way had already been infiltrated by NVA soldiers, and more came in that night of the 30th. We got down to Fubai, met old friends, sat around, went to the MACV compound, drank beer, had a great time. And that night, we got hit with mortars and rockets, out into the bunkers, came back, tried to sleep, got hit again, out into the bunkers. And about 3.30 3 in the morning, they told us to saddle up. I don't know where we went, but we ran a convoy of support for some Marines. And I remember that you could see villagers running through the underbrush, away from way. And we had no idea what was going on. We had I have no idea why we even went where we went. Of course, I was, they just told me. We came back to Fubai, and it was just about time for breakfast, so we went in to get some coffee. And we had barely sat down when they said, hey, you got to saddle up again. We're going into way. There's trouble down at the Mac B compound along the Perfume River. So we formed a convoy again. And this is what we did every day. We'd support units going out on the roads. And we started that up north towards Way. And there was an Arvin base on the left. And I remember they stopped. And we could see a firefight going on over the base on a hillside. And we could actually see the Arvins and NBA soldiers over there. And I, I know we wanted to fire at them. They wouldn't let us fire across the base. And I believe this is where we picked up some Marine M48 tanks. There was a company of Marines with us, which I believe was Alpha 1-1 from the 1st Marine Division. We later connected with Golf Company 2-5 from the 1st Marine Division. I know there was a couple of dusters from Delta Battery, first the 44th, two quad 50s from G65, six or eight Marine M48s, and two companies of Marines. And we had no way of knowing it, but there was nine to 12,000 NBA soldiers in way at that time. So as we moved on up in the way, there was a small bridge over the NQ moat or, or canal. The bridge was blown. We had to make a detour there. There was a lot of firing and incoming from 
that the point sections of Marines were primarily suffering from. And I remember seeing a, a light tank, an Arvin tank, Army Republic of Vietnam, South Vietnamese tank. And I remember the tank commander was on the deck of the tank. And it looked like he was standing there in one of the hatches, but he was between the hatches. It was just his upper torso. And we started getting really, really, uh, you were frightened at that time. Because you could hear incoming rounds, whizzing past and everything else. We moved on in, came to a small market area, like, like a square uh, in, in the street, which was actually Highway 1. And we bailed out of the, off the truck, took a small break there, opened sea rations, and you could hear rounds whipping over your head. And all of a sudden, a, a Marine officer came up and said, hey, Sarge, put some fire on that building up there. And I remember it was a three or four story brick structure. And we fired into it, and all of a sudden you could just see a string of NVA coming out, going towards the rice paddies that were behind it. And we fired at them, knocked down a lot of them before they took cover behind the berms, and proceeded up downtown towards the MACV compound and the Perfume River. And there were columns of Marines on each side. There were tanks being knocked out. We were firing at the buildings. And it was house to house, block by block fighting. It was, it was there were numerous casualties, numerous Marine casualties coming back. Uh, I know that we needed resupplied. We had at least 5,000 rounds. And when we started, we needed resupplied around noon of that day going in the way. The Marines were having to take out the buildings, grenades laws, recoilless rifles, and they were taken casualties throughout this day. As we reached the Mac V compound, we pulled in, we sort of thought, well, this is where we're supposed to go. And talking to the CO, and at that time we were, Golf 2-5 was the unit that was closest to us. And talking to their CO later, he told me that he was given orders to advance across the Wong Jang Bridge, and I may have that name wrong, to the north side of the Perfume River. And we were at that time at the corner of the Citadel, it was right across the river from us, and he was supposed to see if he could enter into the Citadel. And they called us back out of the MACV compound, put the two quads at the base of the bridge, and had us fire across the river to provide support as the Marines started advancing across the bridge. The Marines got about halfway across the bridge and machine gun bunkers that were in the buildings, and it was almost like a park area along the edges of the river. And there were trench lines there, there were bunkers there, there were NVA machine gunners there. And as the Marines got about halfway across, they opened up and the Marines were cut to pieces and came back. A Marine colonel came up to me and said, hey Sarge, do you think you can help us out? And if I had a defining moment in Vietnam, perhaps a defining moment in parts of my life. It was probably then that it was a moment that was really unsaid. Because I remember I looked at the gunner, I looked at the loader that was on the back of the truck with me, and we just shrugged. But I, I think the thought sequence everybody had at that point was, there's no way in hell we're coming back from this. After what we had just seen, what we had just seen happen in the Marines, it was and it's not a her heroic act. You've seen people get decimated. You know something has to be done. It may be a function of being young and dumb and not knowing any better, but it's just uh, that 
there wasn't a question about whether there was an option or not. It was just, it, we go. And we pulled across, and one of the squad leaders from Golf 2-5 later told me, the guy's name was Barney Barnes, who I met 40 years later at a reunion of the people who went into way that day. And he said, you know, I was, I was taking cover, and we were receiving fire, and all I could hear was this clank, clank. And he said, I wondered, what the hell is that? And he said, I looked up, and there was this gun truck, and they were 50 caliber ammo cans being thrown off as you guys would reload. And I do not remember being fired at on the way across the bridge. I assume we were, we must have been, but I do not remember it. We, we just, we got to the other end of the bridge, we sprayed the buildings, we sprayed the edges along both sides without identifiable targets. And all of a sudden I saw motion to my left and there was an NVA officer standing outside of a bunker with a handgun and he was yelling at the people who must have been inside the bunker and all of a sudden one of the guys yelled grenade and we bailed off the truck. Uh, Theodore Harris, who was the loader on the back of the truck, later told me a grenade rolled under the truck where we were and didn't explode. And I remember being behind the duels in the back of the truck with an old uh, Smith & Wesson 38. I'd bartered to some marine for at some point in time and I, I shoot in the, this officer who was still at the corner of the bunker and I decided well we should probably get back up there in those on the machine guns and take take care of this bunker so we got back on the truck and uh, we had real sophisticated communication systems on the back of a quad 50 I beat the gunner on the top of the helmet and turn his head to where I wanted him to fire and I turned him towards the bunker and we depressed the guns and we couldn't come close to it. We were too close to it. It was only about 10 feet away from us and the guns wouldn't depress enough to, to fire in the bunker so we had to yell at the driver to actually pull up closer to the wall of the citadel and we took out the bunker. It, the 50s went through both sides of that and I, I remember seeing the tracers skipping off the Perfume River beyond it. The driver said there was a Marine came up to us and just as he came up to us he took a round through the head, was instantly killed. We loaded him up and we started back across the bridge and picking up dead and wounded Marines the whole way. Got to the MACV compound for the first time I noticed I was, had fragment wounds in my left knee and was bleeding and went in and they cleaned it up and said, you've got to get out of here. To the best of my memory, the two quad 50s pulled into the Mac B compound at the end of that day, and we had all changed barrels once. We'd both been resupplied with ammunition. We'd gone through at least 10 or 15,000 rounds, and we had changed the two spare guns that we carried with us. And I believe between the two gun trucks, there was one tube that would still fire at the end of that day. I was, we, we were under fire that entire night. There was incoming rounds, mortar rounds in the MACV compound. And the next morning they set up a LZ at the edge of the Perfume River on the south side of the river. And I was medevaced out and out to the hospital ship and later ended up in the Philippines. But that was... My total experience with the Tet Offensive, and it was about three weeks later that I came back to the, our base camp at Dong Ha, and at that time I only had a month or two left in, in country, and that was the end of my combat experience. How did you stay in touch with your family while you were letters. I remember one time 
they had the communication system known as the Mars system at that time, which was like satellite radio where you could actually make a phone call back to the states, but that was really not available to us as far north as we were. And the one time I was in Da Nang, I took one look at the line and said no. So it, it was purely through communication with letters. And were you single at this time? I was single, yes. I had a lot of girls I was writing to. So how did you keep busy and creative? When we were at Dong Ha, I remember I and another guy who had played a lot of sports when we were out at Oregon Grande, uh, we played football and baseball and a lot of basketball. He and I were both basketball players. And we found a net that was in some of the gear that they'd sent over with us. They must have thought we were going to have all kinds of time because we had ball gloves and balls and found a basketball net and the basketball so we got a hold of a telephone pole and implanted that thing and put a backboard up and put a basketball up. I also remember some great horseshoe tournaments and volleyball tournaments at base camp in Dong Ha. In other areas there wasn't any recreation. At, at places like Kantian, Quezon, you rarely stuck your head above ground. When we were in Quezon Valley, the first, the first and only time other than a little bit of time when, at Camp Eagle that I was actually attached to Army personnel, our primary recreation was we built a Taj Mahal of a bunker and had a poker table into it. And the Army never could figure out exactly who we reported to. And what was interesting was the infantry unit there happened to be the 7th Cavalry. And I remember I was wondering, how come they always salute each other and say Gary Owen? And then I found out it was Custer's unit. And I didn't, not sure that was a real good idea to be with them. And there was an artillery unit there. And the Army being the Army, very different from the Marines, used to give every squad a case of beer every night. And we thought that was a great idea. So we'd go over to the infantry unit and we'd get a case of beer and then we'd go over to the artillery unit and get a case of beer and they never could figure out there was only four of us in the squad. So. I would make the assumption that you made some uh, close friends over there. Um, did you, any of your buddies have any, um, any wounded or did you lose any friends over there? A lot of people would say, boy, Bob, you're the only person from the unit that actually extended for six months in Vietnam. You must have really been committed and brave and really believed in what you were doing. And the truth of the matter is, in August of 1967, my best friend in the unit was a fellow from Finley, Ohio, named James Lee Tweed. Jim and I went in R&R &R to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Now, we liked it so much that we figured we'd extend in country and we'd go back to Kuala Lumpur for our leave instead of going home to our folks. Unfortunately, Jim was killed. Uh, I believe the first week in September, right before he would have rotated back to the States at that time, I had extended. He never got a chance to. He was a he was a squad leader on a quad 50, but that day for some reason he got in the gun mount and was acting as gunner. And it was a convoy up to a place called Joel Lin along Highway One. Joel Lin being the last town in Vietnam before you hit the river that was the boundary between North and South Vietnam. And it was a well-planned ambush. They took out the lead vehicle, they took out the back vehicle, and they targeted the primary support arms in the convoy, one of which was the Quad 50. And they had snipers in the trees along the edge of the road, and one of them shot right down at Jim. He had the, he had the turret control switch turned on, 
but he didn't have the fire control switch turned on yet, so he was killed almost immediately. I later talked to the driver of that truck, and he is a guy who had almost spent a year in country and been on a lot of convoys, had ducked his head down, put the pedal to the metal, and was pushing vehicles out of the way to get out of the kill zone of the ambush. But he said that when he got out of the truck, he was shaken, and when he stood up, AK-47 brass fell on the fell on the ground. They had actually come up, jumped on the running board of the truck, and sprayed the inside with the, the AKs. But he was down low enough; they didn't get him. Are there any incidents that stand out in your mind about your service in theater, whether it be as the ones we've already discussed? Frightening, exciting, funny, um, any, any type of memories that stand out? Two things. One, I guess, was funny at the time because we were headed down Highway 1 going down towards the MACV compound the first day in way, uh, way. And I remember a Marine pulled to John Wayne. He threw the grenade in the building and it blew up and he ran in there. And he rummaged around for a while, and he came out with a case of warm beer. And both columns stopped for a while, and the beer was passed up and down the columns. And everybody sat down and drank that warm, Lord knows what kind of beer. There's actually a type of beer known as whey beer. I don't know if that's what it was or not. Another thing I remember also from whey was as we were standing down there before we'd probably even noticed that the machine gun bunker was that close to us, I saw a Marine charge the bunker with grenades in each hand. And as he threw the grenades, he was cut down. I saw another Marine charge the bunker, firing from the hip, just doing whatever he could to try to save the other Marines that were on that bridge, I often said I saw what should have been two Medals of Honor won that day and assumed both Marines had been killed. I later found out that one of them was named Sergeant Lester Tully and the other one was named Sergeant Barney Barnes. And I see them every year aboard the USS Way City at our reunion. They were both awarded silver stars for that day, and they both survived, so. Can you talk about uh, citations that you earned during the war? The day in my first Purple Heart came as a result of the date pudding incident. And my second Purple Heart was on the bridge in Way. And I was also awarded a Silver Star for that day. Uh, I think the greatest honor I've ever been given was there was a young platoon leader came in during the battle away, and it was his very first active combat assignment after graduation from the uh, Naval Academy. And that young lieutenant was Peter Pace. I was later introduced to Peter Pace as the guy that was on the Quad 50 on the bridge at one of our reunions in Mayport. And Barney Barnes did the introduction. And he said, Lieutenant, and of course, the guy he was talking to had four stars on his collar, and at that time was vice chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He said, Lieutenant, I'd like you to meet Bob Lauber, and if it wouldn't be for him, a lot of us wouldn't be here. And there's just nothing you can say when somebody says that about you. It, it's the highest honor I've ever been paid. Your 
I can't say I spat upon. And I don't remember a lot of flower children. But I remember when I came back to my true hometown, which is a little town called McVeightown, Pennsylvania. We had 39 people in my graduating class. But we managed to win a state championship in basketball. We were, we were Hoosiers, Pennsylvania style. We were a little Class C school at that time. So we had some guys that if something was done at the school, it was done by us. We, if there was a play to be put on, you had these guys that were in the play. If you had a basketball team, it was these guys that were on the basketball team. Baseball team, these guys were on the baseball team. We were close. We knew each other very well. But I think out of those guys I was close to, I was probably the only one that went in the military. And I remember when I came home and I went downtown, if you can call it downtown when you got a population of about 600 people, and I got together with these guys, they looked at me like I had three heads. They didn't know what to say to me. They acted like I had come from another galaxy. And that was a pain, I think, has, that has never, ever gone away. I took that very personal. And those very close bonds that were established through high school were never, ever reestablished. think that your experiences overseas affected you growing up as a man and affected your wife as a whole? It didn't change the burning desire I had to go to college. I, I, I started college the summer after I was just discharged from the Army. It totally changed some of my outlook on life, probably, and on what was important to me. I was always somewhat the school artist. I made all the posters and everything. When we were traveling during the playoffs, during our state championship year, the bus always carried one of my posters on the side. My best friend and was a teacher who was also the art teacher. And I was all set to go to art school, and I loved sculpture and modeling and that sort of thing. Even though I was a country boy and hunted and fished as my primary recreation, I still had that artistic side of me. That disappeared in Vietnam. That totally went away. I ended up majoring in biology. I became a respiratory therapist. I started a business. I sold a business. I restarted another business. I've had success in life. But I, I Part of me was dissected away from myself in Vietnam, but I kind of, I guess I miss that side of me. But Vietnam defined me as a, as a man, as a person. I knew there was nothing I couldn't do if I set my mind to it. I, uh, and I didn't think about Vietnam. Now. All these years later, I know I was carrying a load of PTSD that wouldn't stop when I came back. But there wasn't a name for it. It just, I needed to get around other veterans, and we needed to try to drink all the beer there was in the world. And we needed to talk about it, but only among ourselves. And I probably never really talked too much about Vietnam for 30 years afterwards. And then all of a sudden, I said, wait a minute, this was history, this was, these are stories that need to be told. These are people that need to be honored. And what we did in Vietnam defined a generation, both those that were in combat and those that were not in combat and probably protesting against the war in Vietnam. But it's amazing how many of those people carry more guilt? I think they have 
more of a problem with what they did and who they were than we did. We weren't baby killers. We weren't wanton savages, and we were not a bunch of drug-addled idiots. I've often said that the people I saw with drug problems in Vietnam were not that original group of guys that came over by boat. They were a lot of their replacements, and I was one of the few people that were around to see what the difference was. And the drug problems they had, and the social problems they had, and the problems they had with the war in Vietnam or with race relations back in the States, they brought with them. Now, I can't speak for 1970, 71, 72, when you hear the stories about fragging of officers, when you hear the stories of race riots and fire bases and that sort of thing. It was a, that was a different time, but I can speak to that period of time in my little corner of Vietnam from 66 to 68. And I've often said, you know, I left the United States to happy days and I came back to Country Joe and the Fish and Flower Children. And I, I said, there is something I missed in that translation that I've, I've never been able to recapture. I came back home, I said about the friends, and when I would go back with the friends, I'd say, hey guys, let's get a couple six packs and go try to pick up some girls. And they'd say, no, we're gonna go down in the basement at Joe's house, and we're gonna listen to this weird music, and we're gonna watch a lava lamp. And I could only take that for a few minutes, and I had to get out of there. Anything, or just one thing, I should say, that you would want your great, 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 great grandkids to know about you and your story to your family. You can think hundred years down the road, and you want them to know one thing about your service or their service. I don't think it'd be about me, and I don't think it'd be about what I I did in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I. I did what was expected of me in Vietnam. I came back to the States. I was not an exemplary soldier. I wanted out of the Army desperately. In fact, I managed to make corporal by the time I got out of the Army. I refused to go into funeral detail of a person who was killed in Vietnam. It really bothered me for some reason. I think that goes back to that load of PTSD I was carrying. And it's hard to get busted if you're the only combat Silver Star winner on a post. And I was. I was in a little tiny post called Fort Ritchie, Maryland. Uh, what I think I'd want them to remember of me was that I was an advocate for the Vietnam veterans, that I tried to do what I could for the Vietnam veterans and the Gold Star mother work of trying to give these women release from the trips we've taken back to Vietnam and shown them where their sons were killed. I think that might be the more important part of it and the fact that I helped veterans and veterans' families come to grips with Vietnam and what it meant and what happened to them during that time. Is there anything else you'd like to document? Uh, I think that's probably okay. all I can think about. Okay. Fantastic. Very good. Very good. Pretty good. Hey, that was fantastic. <laughs>